Welcome everyone. Welcome all the angels um, to the Thirsty Thursday tonight. We are joined by Kathy Howard from Boots and All. Um, Neil can't join us, unfortunately, but um, I'm sure Kathy will be able to regale us with some stories. And uh, Adrian and Rebecca Santalin from Santalin Wines. Uh, just quickly before we get to it, uh, housekeeping as per usual, uh, we can't see or hear you. So to ask questions, just click down the bottom in the Q&A and fire the questions away. I will attempt to uh, feed those to the guys as we go. Um, if we don't, I hopefully we'll get them all done at the end. So um, we also do have a poll running tonight um, and it will flash up on the screen. So please um, participate. Uh, it's all around how many of uh, the angels have met a winemaker um, in real life or virtually. Um, so yeah, just pop, your, pop your vote in there and we can um, talk to that later on in the night. Okay, so let's pass it over to Kathy. Um, so Kathy, hope you're well, how are you? Oh, very good, thanks. We're, uh, well, WA is in a, in a hard border lockdown. So uh, everything inside is slowly but surely um, returning to some sort of normal, I suppose. Good yeah, to hear. So, uh, Very good to hear. Yeah. Unlike, unlike Adrian and Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Kathy, can you, can you quickly just, you know, get everybody, let everyone know how you got into winemaking um, and then we can talk to the brand and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, just a bit of background on how you got into winemaking. Oh, sure. Actually, it, um, it all started with animals, believe it or not. So it was horses. I've um, spent most of my adult life uh, competing on horses and I thought that uh, a trip to South Australia, I might look at doing horse management, went out to Roseworthy Agricultural mm -hmm. College and um, I got shown around the, the winery and the vineyard there and I just went, oh, perfect, this is for me. So that was, um, when was that, mid-80s. But I was there in the bicentennial year. I started my course at 88. Yeah, so it came about through that. I've, had, I've still got horses today. So the, the animals run along through my life as long as, along with winemaking and vineyards and um, everything else associated with wine. Fantastic. And you obviously like it because you haven't really done anything else. So what, what, why, do you, why do you like winemaking so much? Well, actually, I did do one other thing. I worked for Cascade Brewery for a few years, so I have done some brewing too, which is kind of very similar to wine. Uh, the thing for me which got me into wine, as well as why I've stayed, is all the relationships that you build up over time with uh, uh, grape growers, truck drivers, um, people working on bottling lines, and also um, people like the angels. It's, it's the customers who drink your wines. So it's like you have this complete little circle from um, growing it to uh, bottling it to drinking it and having people um, giving you feedback. I think it's great. It's um, a job that has you outside as well as inside. So there's this wonderful combination of not being stuck behind a desk. Uh, there are times during vintage where I actually wouldn't mind being stuck behind a desk though. That, uh, <laughs> probably be an easier way to work on occasions, especially when it's about uh, midnight and you think, no, nah, I think I've had enough now. But um, at the end of the day, it's, it's seeing the fruits of all, all that labour. It's drinking the wine that you've made and then seeing other people enjoying it that really makes it for me and for Neil as well. We, we both feel the same. Yeah. And um, you have, you've been uh, on both sides in the corporate world and, and working for yourself. Is that correct? Yes, so I started out, so yes, Cascade Brewery. Then I went to Orlando Wyndham, who um, at Jacobs Creek. So I worked at their Roll and Flat wineries. So that's 25,000 tonnes. And then my next winemaking job a few years later was, um, oh, the dog's barking out there, was St. Hallett. So that was down to about, I think then we were doing about 5,000 tonnes. And then Neil and I, and we're doing about 150. <laughs> So over, over time, I've started off very large and come down to very small, but it's all hands-on, um, which I love. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that sort of leads us to the question about your brand. 
if you could explain to people what it is and where the name comes from and you know the styles of wines that you make okay so boots and all um it's it's one of those sayings that um we put everything into into making our wines growing our grapes and making our wines so that's was the how the idea of the boots came about and if you have a look at the label it's got absolutely everything on it not just our boots it's got um uh chooks so we we compost our winery waste um we do use chook manure that goes back into the vineyard into the garden here um we also we're hands-on with our wine making so it's got um hats and gloves and secateurs and buckets and spades and shovels that's all that hands-on wine making and a basket press because we actually put all our reds through a basket press um can you, just quickly can you explain to people what that is and 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 how laborious that can be oh yeah neil is actually very good at explaining that because he's <laughs> the one who does all the shoveling <laughs> so basket press um we have uh, it's a, um, we have two, an older version and, and a newer version. So it, it's like a, a big cage, which is where the name basket comes from, with wooden slats that are running around it. Um, and you shovel all the grape skins. You pump away all the, um, the liquid at the end of the red ferment, and you're just left with mushy skins. And you shovel them into the basket press inside it, um, and you fill it up. That takes um, about a ton and a half of uh, grape skins, which is all shoveled by Neil. So he's inside the fermenter, shoveling them into the top. Um, you put that under a, a big press frame, which has a hydraulic ram, and it just comes down. And it does all the pressing. So that's the bit where he can sit down and relax and have a, a cupper and wait for it to finish pressing. And then at the end of it, you're left with this solid hard cake of grape skins, which you have to shovel to get rid of and then you start it all over again right. yeah but the um the beauty of them is that you end up with reds that have got lovely uh, nice tannins but soft tannins because it doesn't press at high pressures so you don't get bitter tannins out of the out of the grape seeds right and sorry you were going you were talking about the brand sorry i interrupted you oh yeah no that's fine well basket pressing is is a is a big part of what we do um I think oh so so everything um, is is small batch sizes so we ferment everything in open fermenters we do all the um, all the work in the winery ourselves the only bit we don't do is actually bottle it but I do go to the bottling line the bottling lines just down the road so uh, yeah I mean uh, growing grapes and making wine over here is good in that everything that we need is close at hand uh, over here can you just tell everyone where you are and oh, over here. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sorry, <laughs> I should do that too. So, um, Western Australia, down in the southwestern corner, where um, there's Perth up here, and there's a little boot shape like that toe, and um, where we are is right in the middle of um, the Cape to Cape region. So we're right next door to Margaret River. Um, we would be three-hour drive from Perth to give you an idea where we are. And what varieties do well in Geograph? Oh, so what we're growing here is Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, a little bit of Viognier. Um, we buy in some other grapes. So we, we buy in some Shiraz and some Malbec and um, or two lots of different Shiraz from Friends Vineyards, which is from different areas, um, gives us different flavours. And so what we're aiming with, with the wines in Boots and All, is you'll find that they're all blends, which is great. So I'd, um, the new ones coming out um, have a little bit of Malbec blended in, um, and Shiraz and Malbec blended in with Cabernet, and our Sauvignon Blanc has a bit of Semillon. And the, bl the blending happens because we get more weight in the wine, we get lovely texture and flavour. And it just gives you a better balanced structure of wine. Fantastic. Okay, um, Adrian and Rebecca, would, do you want to let everyone know a bit more about how you guys got into winemaking? Where do we start? <laughs> well, actually, we're both studying different things. <laughs> um, uh, I will. Well, look, I'll, 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 keep, I'll keep it really short. <laughs> I haven't got into winemaking because I suck at everything else. <laughs> That's not true. 
<laughs> no, look, I grew up in Griffith in New South Wales and it's a fairly um, agricultural area. So um, lots of vineyards and orchards and, and um, yeah, lots of food and wine really. Why so you grew up with your Italian family, you know? Yeah, so look, I, look, when I was a really young kid, I, I wanted to be a winemaker or, or a farmer. Um, and when you get to your teenage years, uh, you sort of think there's got to be something a bit more glamorous, you know. So I, I went off to uni and, you know, I just wanted to get the hell out of Griffith and uh, um, studied something completely different, which was uh, sports management. Um, and that provided me with uh, zero job opportunities. Uh, so, I, I, look, I went back to Griffith and um, uh, just thought, you know what, um, this is what you do. Yeah, what you know. this is what I know and this is what I am good at. Yeah. And so, uh, look, at it, it's, I guess it started again from there and uh, um, then sort of worked at a few very large wineries in, or worked at a very large winery in Griffith, um, moved to the Hunter Valley, um, got to experience, you know, one of Australia's sort of classic wines in, in Hunter Semyon. And, uh, and then we, we both sort of settled in the, the Yarra Valley. Um, so, and then working at different wineries across the Yarra and, uh, a couple of nearby regions as well. So, uh, yeah, we, we, and then I guess what we fell in love with the Yarra Valley was, you know, we both had a love of Pinot uh, and Chardonnay and uh, this is a wonderful area for that. And, um, you know, and it's just sort of a nice place to live as well. Just near, not, Yarra is not too far away from Melbourne. So it's a sort of a handy place to be. Get locked down and yeah. <laughs> it's great. We're right in that zone. It's yeah. Great. First day of lockdown today. Woo! Um, and can you can you tell us a little bit about the brand Sandlin and and all the tiers and the styles? So Boy Meets Girl, sort of. So, before, so when we first sort of got into wine or making wine, we'd you know we'd have our friends and family and whatever over, and and they all just seemed like bamboozled by all this crazy wine talk and you know the cassis and the this and the that and all this crazy stuff. So we just wanted to. Firstly, like with our Boy Meets Girl range, to create a range. I mean, it's got a cartoon on the front of us, obviously. It's like a spitting image. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but we just wanted to make it really simple, you know, it's, you know, easy, fun, don't think too hard. Um, I've sort of wine styles in there that everyone could enjoy, everyone understands. I mean, we love them. We bring, you know, just to bring them to our family and friends and, you know, we all sit around and drink them. And it's, you know, they're just really fun, easy to drink. Don't not overcomplicated just you know um easy <laughs> did i say that enough <laughs> um and so that's what hence you know the boy meets girl and, and that sort of started and the whole idea of that behind that was us when we first met in griffith um wanting to one day make our own wine, wine label and so boy meets girl is kind of you know the combination of that um our a and r range is sort of our, our next level up just in terms of you know the fruit quality um it's a you know the, the you know the wine making styles that we sort of employ in, and and i guess you know those wines are perhaps a little bit more adventurous there's some interesting blends and some interesting varieties and you know we're looking for you know new and upcoming or you know not so not so well-known regions so they're just a bit more of an explore, exploration so for anyone who kind of knows our boy meets girl range and loves our boy meets girl range it's kind of the next step up in in discovery in wine discovery i guess um and then we've got our family reserve which i have a bottle here so that's kind of our top of the range um wines and i guess and, and through each step that the boy meets girl was supposed to be sort of a representation of us needing and wanting to make wine a and r was kind of a you know solidifying our relationship and it's adrian rebecca and the family reserve i guess kind of is our family you know it's all a bit little, sounds a bit corny but you know it's kind of the, the the three tiers and 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 i guess they are our yarra valley wines um we we make and release only a small batch once every year um they're all very much hand produced um minimal intervention um and just sort of um the two wines and varieties that grow really well here in the yarra um that we we personally love um pinot noir is just my if i could drink one wine for the rest of my life, it'd be peanut. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of us and our wines and the ranges. <laughs> yeah. And you, because you, you don't just source wine from Yarra, you source <clears throat> wine from other regions as well. 
Correct. Yeah. So the the family reserve wines, um, the fruit from that is purely 100% Yarra Valley. Um, the A&R range, we will, we're just sort of, we look for um, regions that, in Victoria, um, that are growing, yeah, interesting things or doing things a little bit differently. And the Boy Meets Girl range, um, just due to the um, volumes and the, the price point, um, we, we need to source that from, we source that from vi um, vineyards in Victoria. Yeah, it's a, a blend of regions, really. Yeah. 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 There's, there seems to be a quite a few questions here um, or comments, Stephen, and um, uh, there was another person here that had the same question, but it's all, all regarding the genteel. Um, can you tell people what that is? Um, I don't think there's any, unfortunately, next, um, I'm from 2020, but still. Be yeah. interesting to tell people what it is. <laughs> no, it's a good question. And this is a, or you, you tell a story. I've done lots of talking. <laughs> uh, look, uh, one of our, I guess our shared passions are, are wines from the Alsace region in France. Uh, and, and so we, we, we always wanted to make one and Naked Wines gave us that, that opportunity because yeah. uh, I don't think, I don't think we would have been able to make or, or well, we, even if we made it, I don't think we would have mm -hmm. been able to sell it. Uh, because it's it's sort of not that well known in in Australia, yeah. um, so it, it's it's sort of we source varieties that are, are um, um, that are sort of um, from of from from that region. So it's a field blend of yeah. of certain varieties that that are um, I guess that make up like an Alsatian wine. So it's you know it's Pinot Gris, Riesling, um, yes. Gewurz, um, and look sometimes we sneak a little bit of something in there trying to make the wine taste as if how we want it to, to taste. But uh, um, yeah, so we, we source those varieties and it's a really fun thing on the, on the bench. It's sort of my favorite wine yeah. to, to make at blending time because there's, there's so many options, you know, and there's, because the wine's called Gentile, you know, we don't, we don't have to, we don't have to use the same proportion of each variety every year in, year out. So, you know, it, it could, one year it could be, predominantly Gewurz, another year it could be Riesling or, or Pinot Gris. So, um, you know, we're just looking to make the strongest wine, um, the most, you know, it's got to be aromatic. It's got to have that lovely sort of little bit of um, sort of lime and citrus and, and, and maybe a citrus blossom and, and that Slightly mineral mineral sort of line. But yeah, it is off dry as well. So um, it's it's so many options on the bench and it's a, it's a, it takes you on a bit of a journey when, when you're sort of trying to find the, the correct yeah. the correct blend and um it, yeah look we, we enjoy drinking it and uh the thing that naked wines sort of made possible was that we could once it was made you know we we could put it on this platform and and it, tell us. and tell the story otherwise yeah. you know we would have there's no way like yeah. on a shelf to be able to you can't tell that story on a shelf yeah. and so yeah. this really is a wine that naked wines um, I guess nurtured and allowed because it is certainly it was one of our passion. I think you know um, from the Edelsbicker region in Alsace, and there was a lot of wines there that we you know had tasted and had fallen and in love with, and we wanted we're desperate to make our own sort of version of that here. And when when we joined Naked Wines, I think we came up to you, Mark, and said, Mark, we want to do this crazy mental thing where we're going to mix up, and you're just like, yeah, go for it. <laughs> give it a go we'll give it a go because that's what you know um and the angels have really just embraced that and every year yeah it seems to go really well and it's just an interesting in, a really interesting wine that you don't obviously you don't see a lot of that style um here in australia but it, it yeah e easy drinking and yeah more of a feel blend of, of such um yeah, yeah. Um, and just quickly, another question, a couple of people are mentioning another string to your bow, which is the, the cider. Um, Robert uh, is wanting to know what varieties go into the cider, <coughs> apple varieties. <coughs> Good question. Uh, or is it a commercial secret? <laughs> no, no, it's not no. a secret. Um, look, it's... It's, it's our family <laughs> recipe. <laughs> it's, a it's a majority um, uh, pink lady apples with a little bit of Granny Smith and the Granny Smith sort of gives you the, the lovely acidity and the the pink ladies, pink ladies mainly the, the the flavor so it um wasn't too much not too much experimentation there it was kind of kind of just worked out well and um look we we just sort of we make it in a very simple style make it like a sparkling wine yeah. so you know it's, it's it is cited by winemakers um and you know there's yeah, but it look we we also make you know we 
don't want to make it too too sweet. So no. it's, it's it's kind of a, I guess if you compare it to a lot of other ciders out there on the market, it, it's uh, slightly on the, uh, going towards a drier style. Yeah. And it is, a, I guess, a more delicate, delicate style cider. Yeah. Um, low alcohol, obviously, oh, low alcohol for a cider, it's like about five, five and a half percent. But yeah, it's, it's just, a, it's, I guess with all the wines that, that we make, they're all styles, that we just make what we enjoy drinking because that's what we're most passionate about so that's just the sort of style of cider i personally enjoy drinking in summer it's light um it's made from real apples it tastes like real apples <laughs> not just sort of flavored apple flavored sugar syrup so um yeah and i guess that's that's sort of a motto with all, all our wines we just kind of well, yeah i guess that's make what we know well yeah you, you, while you try and um, make a wine to what you think people will like i think at the end of the day, you've got to like it yourself. So when, when you're making a wine, you sort of got to go, yeah, if you stick with a sort of style that you enjoy um, or a, a flavour profile that you enjoy, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to enjoy that wine too because you're just following that that path. And, um, yeah, it's sort of just staying true to to the variety and, and your, your philosophy and um, you're going to make a, a, you know, a good wine at the end of the day. Well, we'll, we'll think it's good anyway. <laughs> And Katie wants to be reassured that there will be one this year. There is. There is. I've got there to start work. I've got to start work on it pretty soon. There so. definitely is. I'm pretty excited. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, okay, Kathy, back to you. Um, just uh, could you quickly just quick to let us know how how Neil got into wine and then how you guys actually met. In okay. The wine so, world. um, beg your pardon. Yeah, how you met in the wine world. Yes, sorry, go on. Oh, the wine world, yes. Yeah, the wine world's a very small world, actually, which will make sense when I get to that bit. Um, so Neil's, Neil's background, he grew up in the Pyrenees area of uh, Victoria. So most of his working life, um, he's worked in vineyards. So we're a, um, a vineyard winemaking couple. So he, he brings the expertise um, to grape growing and vineyards to the table and all, as well as his muscles for um, helping out in the, in the winery. Um, so he, yeah, from um, working in the Pyrenees, he actually worked um, for Blue Pyrenees, Tautani. Then he ended up managing um, Mount Avoca's vineyard for oh, 10 odd years, I think. Um, and then Sandalford. Uh, poached him so he moved over to Western Australia but I didn't meet him until he'd already moved here and it was through a mutual winemaking friend of ours um, we'd he'd worked with Peter over in um, at Sandalford and I'd worked with Peter at Orlando and he just asked us over one um, tech at a wine technical conference which was held in Adelaide when I was working at St Helot and we met at Pete's place over a duck curry I think it was <laughs> And the rest is history. So towards the end of that that year, um, I thought it was time to time to move. So I moved over to the west. It's been great. I don't. I love. I really love living in the Barossa, but I don't miss summers there. In all honesty, too hot. And I, uh, yeah, oh, too hot. And it's actually from a winemaking point of view, um, I feel like I've got. I can make better wine continuously <laughs> over here, whereas the Barossa was. Um, I mean, great, uh, uh, sorry, just had a little box come up. Um, it was great for, I mean, I, that's where I cut my teeth making Riesling and, and Shiraz in the Barossa, but I, I love the more delicate flavours and elegance and savouriness that you get over here with the slightly cooler climate. Yeah, so um, that's how we met. There you go. Fantastic. And, and this friend of ours keeps on reminding us every time you see him. He said, if it wasn't for me, he came to our wedding too. And he kept on saying, if it wasn't for me, this you wouldn't be here. <laughs> okay. And how do you find working and living together? Is it I mean, I suppose it's a it's good that one of you is a winemaker and one's a vineyard, but let us tell us. Oh. Well, yes. Well, that's, yes, there are lines drawn, though, because um, I, I certainly don't know. Um, I think he says winemakers only go into vineyards just before vintage. <laughs> so you don't see them before that. So I'm always very conscious of, um, and I'm not all that good at pruning. He won't let me prune. I'm good at wrapping down, which is when you wrap a cane around a wire 
caught on wire, but apart from that, no, he doesn't trust me with screening. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but we, uh, look, we, we have our moments and I mean, married couples have moments for whatever reason. So I suppose um, lockdown for us didn't really affect us because it's what we normally do. I mean, we, we work together, we live together. Um, and we've got some great friends through through um, working in the industry too. So, and I think I've always, uh, my, my family um, understand vintage kind of, but unless you've actually lived it and worked it, then you don't fully understand the grind and the commitment that vintage is. Um, so when your, hours, your partner, I mean, Adrian and, and Becca um, understand, you, you don't have to explain things. <laughs> no. <laughs> you, know, like, you understand it there. Yeah. 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 Well, we do have some, um, yes, the, the cooking, whose turn it is to cook <laughs> during vintage <laughs> can be a bit challenging. <laughs> We're both very good at cooking, but it's, you know, who's, who's the least tired to actually yeah. cook something and yeah, awesome. <laughs> get a meal together. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, um, and we just saw the the uh, poll just pop up there. Not men, not more. More people have not visited or met a uh, a winemaker, um, but you guys have a cellar door and quite a famous cellar door uh, for a special reason. Can you elaborate? Yes, so we have a um, a wine sensory garden which is uh, the only one of its kind in Australia. The, the Waite Institute in Adelaide have a very small one. I haven't actually been there to have a look, but um, the idea for it came about when we opened our cellar door and, and we wanted to have a connection between food and wine, how to do it without putting in a, a cafe or a restaurant. Uh, both Neil and I love gardening, so it came about that, uh, why don't we do something with gardening? I honestly can't remember how I came across the whole idea of wine sensory gardens now, but they're very big in California. So uh, Kendall Jackson, I actually uh, to and fro with them a little bit via email, and um, they were quite forthcoming with um, some suggestions, and uh, they were on my bucket list to come and to go and visit them, but that'll have to wait for a bit longer now. But the whole idea of this wine sensory garden is it's got some um, garden beds that are laid out, so planted out to fruit trees, herbs, flowers, uh, vegetables that um, would have flavours that describe each of the wine varieties that we grow and um, make into wine here. And then there's also a dedicated section for each of those that's uh, to do with food and wine pairing. So that's where more ve um, seasonal vegetables come in, um, but a lot of herbs. So it's got an educational aspect to it, so people can wander around and pick and smell and taste herbs with a glass of wine in one hand. It's just a way of um, developing a, um, uh, some descriptors that you can use to, to uh, use in conversation with people as to what flavours you're seeing in a wine, what flavours you like, what you don't like. Um, and then learning that it's very easy to um, to match or to pair food and wine just with a few herbs in a sauce or a dressing. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be, it's, it's not complicated. It's just um, learning at your own pace and um, picking up ideas as to how you can describe something. And it's actually interesting, one, um, when people start out, they ask, I do get questions about when do you put the peaches or the apples into a wine, which is an interesting, and that's how we write. We write um, wine tasting notes that talk about it's got flavours of this, flavours of that. Um, yeah. And why wouldn't people think that you add it? Because, I mean, gin is flavoured like that. You add something to the gin to give the flavour. Uh, so then the whole conversation can start happening about, no, it's a way of um, being able to come up with um, different terms and develop a language that you can then talk to other people about wine like you do with food. Because you do, when you think about sitting down and having a meal, you talk about what it is that you like or don't like in the tastes, and wine's no different. Yeah. Have you got some of the uh, examples that you could? Oh yeah, I had some I, something I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be as simple as yeah, you know, lemon. So I've got a glass of Sauvignon Blanc here. So I've just um, rushed out to the garden to pick a few things. So lemon. 
Um, and then other lemon flavours, um, lemongrass, which lots of people I'm sure would be familiar with, especially if you love Asian cooking. It smells divine. This is where you need smell as well as... Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, now, if you... I uh, say so to people, if, if you pick um, Sauvignon Blanc, you can pick it at different um, stages of ripeness. So when it's on the earlier, picking it earlier, like uh, we can do, we do with our Sauvignon Blanc, you get the lemongrass, you get lemon, which can be lemon balm, or like the lemon that I had here. Um, and you leave it a little bit riper, then you start getting flavours like pineapple. Now this is actually pineapple sage, which um, best way I describe it is it's like um, opening up a, a tin of canned pineapple. So they're the sorts of flavours that you can, a combination that you can have in a wine. And not everyone sees them, but it's just a way of striking up a conversation, learning, and then um, there's so many times even I go, oh, what's that smell? It reminds me of something. And that's where the garden comes in because it can give you a little prompt and start a conversation because the other thing about wine is if, if everybody talks about wine, then everyone learns from it too because you come up with ideas. I, I also write down descriptors when I have people here at Cellar Door because I come up with new words I can use, which is great. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, Michael would like to know, um, are there also flavours from the earth? Ah, very good question. Yes, the old minerality question. Um, I believe there is in some way, and I think it's to do with the acid in grapes. Now, um, I, I can see like a Riesling, say, coming from Franklin River over here in Western Australia, I've got, they, they're grown in soil that's got like slaty um, granite, but very light and sandy. Um, and you almost, not that you go around licking <laughs> Um, slate or anything to get a you know to get the taste of it but if you can imagine that as a character in the wine um, and here over uh, closer to Margaret River we get more Einstein and we have um, uh, what I call like a, um, oh, a, a flinty character like a gunpowder character especially with our um, both our barrel fermented whites and reds there has been a fair bit of research done on it um, in our, you know, our various wine research institutions that have tried to find what it is that um, gives this minerality that people talk about. What is it in the soil that the plants are taking up? And they haven't been able to come to any conclusions yet. But I'm convinced that it's somehow connected with, um, yes, there is something that the grapes are taking up because that comes back to the whole concept of terroir. Because Sauvignon Blanc, say, growing in one area is going to taste completely different to another. And a lot of it will come back to soil and also the climate they're growing in. I'm not quite sure if that's answered it. It's kind of, yes, I think there is, but I can't prove it. <laughs> um, uh, quickly, while we've got you, Jeff also asks what the bottles are on top of the cupboard behind you. Oh, boots and all. That's an all level, yeah. Yep. Oh, you probably can't see it very well. There we go. There's the dog. She <laughs> was barking at her. I don't know if you heard her. I think she's got kangaroos she's sorting out. <laughs> yep. I should, we should have put a kangaroo on the label. They're probably doing a good job of fertilising the vineyard. Yeah, um, but that's just showing the design of um, everything swirling. Uh, it's Neil's idea for the label, actually. So every, all those things I was talking about earlier are just swirling down into a bottle, which is at the um, very end there. And that, can you introduce the dog as well? Quite famous oh, now. Oh, Polly. Yeah, she is a famous dog. Yeah. Yep. Polly the wine dog. She's a, a black Kelpie, and um, she's, a, she's a little bit of a princess, actually, because she's very good at having a photo taken. <laughs> so we have had, um, she ended up in the Wine Dogs book a few years ago, and they thought she was great, because she'd just sit and say, oh, which side, this side, that side? <laughs> um, yeah, so she's, she's very good to take photos of. So that's, she does feature very prominently in our social media. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and she loves people coming to Cellador. Yeah, she's a bit of a 
cool thing there too. Fantastic. And Michael Anderson asks, uh, do you use French or American oak? Oh, okay. Uh, we, we use both. <laughs> uh, mostly French, but I do use a little bit of American as well because I find that American um, gives me uh, flavours coming out of the barrel that, that um, can enhance the savoury uh, spicy flavours I've got in, in the fruit. So uh, Shiraz from cooler areas tends to have a little bit more uh, pepper and spice and a savouriness, a bit like black olive juice. And the um, American oak barrels, it's actually, I suppose it's more the way the barrels are toasted that gives uh, flavours, um, imparts flavours to the wine that are beneficial. Whereas French oak, um, I, I do use in our Sauvignon Blanc and in our in our Cabernet and Dacheraz here. Fantastic. Okay, Adrian and Rebecca, um, can you tell us how you guys met in the wine world? <laughs> Go uh, for it, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't really a, a wine world uh, meeting. It might have, uh, there was alcohol involved, but yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we, we met at a really dodgy nightclub and uh um it's true yeah it's it's, true. it's it's not really a romantic story I, uh, it was in griffith it was in griffith <laughs> yeah it was late at night i was about to leave one of rebecca's friends knew my friends and introduced us and uh he was yeah. really tall there was like the tallest guy there i was like hey he's right yeah so and then, uh, judge, like yeah. the nightclub was literally during the day. It was at an old Italian was, pokey club, yeah. and at night they brought up the windows, and so you're dancing on carpet, you know, next to the pokey machines. Dodgy, with nice lights flashing, but it was yeah, it was like dodgy. Really classy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, all yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's how we met, um, and just turned out we were working at the same winery. Um, oh wait, no, we were, you. We weren't working at the same place at that time. But you would come back for holidays and work there. No, no, you were at Barnes. Not there. It was at Dubois. You were working at Barnes. No, I wasn't. All right. She's, she's forgotten the story now. The real the story. story is she was working somewhere else and then we ended up working at the same place. We, we were already working at the same place. <laughs> he was going to uni and would come back and work at that place during the holidays yeah. and I was yeah. there. <laughs> Yeah. That's the real after, story. after we met. <laughs> and, and Peter Quirk has asked, Rebecca, how did you get into wine? That's a good question. So I actually, I grew up in Melbourne and I was studying fashion. Um, I was going to be a fashion designer. Uh, and my parents got a job in Griffith, so I had to move to Griffith. So I was a little bit grumpy with them for a little while because they ruined and shattered my dreams of wanting to become a fashion designer and studying fashion in Melbourne. But um, yeah, when I moved to Griffith, I was going to work there for a year and earn my money so I could go back to Melbourne and keep studying fashion design. And I got a job at a at a winery and got introduced to the world of wine and started off by drinking lots of really sweet, sweet wines, which I loved. And it kind of got me into the wine world and I kind of haven't looked back since. It's just been, yeah, a bit of a ride since then. And then, yeah, when I was working, I met Adrienne. I wasn't working somewhere else. I worked there and met Adrienne. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, we just kind of, that was the beginning. And here we are. <laughs> And, and how do you guys find working and living, living a, together? It's a bit like this conversation we just <laughs> had. Like it, it's, a, it's, it's nothing but uh, disagreeing on facts. And, I mean, and after this, oh. I'll lay down the facts and prove that I was right. But yeah. And then I will lay down my facts <laughs> and tell him that he's wrong. So it's, it's, it's very much like this all the time. So we can't have a serious yeah. conversation. Well, unless because we're, yeah. he's always wrong. <laughs> No, look, it, um, look, we, we ended up, before we started working for ourselves, um, we were working for you know, the same company. Um, so we, we previously worked together. And then, um, you know, when we did sort of, work, when we did work at different places, you know, it's still both in the wine industry. Um, so it, we've worked together and apart and, uh, and then obviously for our own business. Um, so uh it, it's been interesting and each, each one presents its own benefits and, and challenges it does. Um, i think we kind of just we're very different in the way our minds and our brains work and think of situations i think but our end goals and where we want to head 
are the same. So we kind of just, I don't know, we seem to work, we just kind of fill the gaps with each yeah, other and yeah. kind of work well together. Yeah, some, somehow we somehow we end up working pretty well together. It's, I'm not really we, we sure come how. from we come from like absolute opposite <laughs> ends, and it just opposite. it just happens to it's work ridiculous. somehow. So, yeah. Anything that anything I say, I'm like, oh, I really, I was that's really nice, or I really like that. He's like, I was just about to say how much that was really annoying me. <laughs> like in every in everything, I, we're just so opposite, yeah. but somehow. It yeah, I mean, I've got really great taste in music, and her sucks. <laughs> like a, it's like. Come on, the 90s is a face, man. <laughs> Everything about the 90s. <laughs> Anything you can dance to, right? Come on. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of questions here. Um, Nick Joseph um, asks, do you have any plans to set up a cell at all? He'd love to drive up and knock back a few. Yeah, oh, I think that's definitely um, our long-term aim. I think, you know, we, we started out, in 2012 on our own naked wines gave us the opportunity to do go out on our own um but going out on your own and doing it on your own in the wine world it's it's a really expensive thing to do you know there's a lot of you know capital and a, a lot of money up front so look we're sort of at that point you know um, and because of naked wines um it really and it really is and we get asked that all the time is it you know is it true the stories is it you know 100 percent um, we wouldn't be where we are today or, you know, be doing what we're doing today if it wasn't for Naked Wines and the Angels. Um, so I think, yeah, we're sort of, you know, got our winery set up and making our own wines, but absolutely the, the goal is to then sort of in the future have a cellar door where we can welcome you all and uh, have a few drinks <laughs> with you all. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, and Jonathan asks, um, lots of disagreement, but who decides on the grapes, the wine, the bottling? That's a really good question, actually. It's a, look, it's a bit of a team effort. Um, yeah. uh, look, my, I've got the easy job, and, and that's just making the wine. Like So uh, if, if you've got good grapes, you make good wine, it's really easy. And, and then Rebecca's got, she runs every other part of the business, so she does all the... The marketing she organizes bottlings she look i don't i can't even i can't even describe what she does because she does everything else and that's how i describe she does everything else so you know so, and, yes, so she's, she's, she's she's got the harder job and she makes all the business decisions and i just sort of chime up or complain going hey that's not fair what about this uh but like when and I but like also, yeah we, we sort of we sort of like certain wines or you know yeah. we, we get excited about um yeah different varieties or, or wine styles or something that we've seen or something we enjoy and love. And, and, and that, that influences, influences us a lot. So I think like the cider, you know, I, you know, want a cider, something nice and light and easy to drink during summer or, you know, I'll come in. Um, well, you know, I'm there in the winery helping out and, um, you know, we'll blend up the wines together and taste through the wines together. And who makes the decision? I don't know. Cause we kind of just feed off each other when, when we're doing that. Yeah. Like, yeah, I like this. And he'll say, no, well, maybe this. And I'll say, no, I think that you're wrong. And I think we should do this. Maybe then, it's me. And then I'll go away and do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, clear as mud. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, <laughs> and Margaret <clears throat> Knight says, uh, we're really big fans of the, <clears throat> excuse me, Family Reserve Pinot. Um, love its earthiness and fruit. How is it shaping up this year? Uh, really good question. 2020. 2020 was a really difficult year, um, uh, like for a lot of regions and, and yeah. us too. So uh, most of Australia struggled with drought. We we were fortunate with with that. Like we had some lovely rainfall. Um, so uh, through the growing season, we uh, we were sort of looking in a in a pretty good spot. Um, and then along came sort of uh, fruit set. So when when the vines flower and then um, Basically, the the they they turn into to to berries from from there. Um, if you get so cold and wet weather, um, that that fruit set's quite quite poor, and all those flowers don't actually turn into to berries. Um, and so that had happened to be a bit of a cold, wet sort of flowering period, and so there was a bit of poor fruit set, um, and that just affects the yield. It doesn't really affect quality too much, uh, and. Then obviously um, along came all those bushfires, which um, 
Look, at, at the end of the day, there's people's homes and, and yeah. livelihood that were at stake. And so, um, you know, and yes, there were there were vineyards that, that got affected by by um, smoke taint. And we, we were, we were fortunate, fortunate enough that... We didn't have... The bushfires weren't in our in our, in our area. Region. And, and um, we were getting a little bit of smoke coming through from Gippsland, but, uh, you know, we were fortunate enough. But that didn't affect... It hasn't um, affected. Hasn't affected. Like, there was... By the time, the thing with, uh, I guess, very, very simply, yeah. um, if smoke travels a certain distance or, or a great distance, um, a lot of those offending compounds that cause smoke taint fall out by the time they get to... to uh, our, well, region. Got to our region so yeah even though there was a little bit of that happening it didn't you know we, we've been fortunate enough for it to have not affected the fruit. uh and and then from there uh there was it was still kind of challenging because it then it sort of became really really wet mm. there was a lot of rain disease pressure um so it was a difficult difficult vintage and then obviously COVID-19 <laughs> hit so it throws a lot of logistical spanners in in there as well so really difficult vintage I think we've, um, we've but pretty much thrown everything this vintage like this has been the most but i think the Chard chardonnays look really good and chardonnay is a really hardy variety it grows in so many regions and different climates it's it's you know it's kind of like a weed and i say that all the time but it <laughs> it, it, it it i think out of 20 we'll see some really fantastic chardonnays because of that sort of cooler cooler um growing season and uh, you have the lovely natural acidity that remains the minerality um, they have lovely line and length and structure, um, but they've still got that, that, I guess that's where the winemaking comes in. That's where you can build a bit of uh, uh, mouth weight and, and, and um, complexity and, and palate weight. And uh, uh, so in barrel, they're, they're looking quite good. You know, I think we'll have some, they're the stars of the vintage, the Chardonnay. Um, Pinots, they're going to be, there's lovely fragrance and a really pretty aroma and flavours in there. Um, maybe a little bit one dimensional. This this year, they're just lacking a little bit of complexity. Uh, they'll still, you know, still be good, but it's, you know, it, I think, I think we've been spoiled by, or well, in the Yarra, we've been spoiled by having some fantastic vintages, you know, 17 and 18 were probably the best vintages of, of all time in terms of Chardonnay and Pinot. Um, oh, and you know, 19 was a little bit warmer. So you got the really lo lovely riper sort of spectrum, but without being too warm. So you just got big, bold flavors. Um, and then, you know, 15 was great, 13 was great, 12 was great. So, you know, it's kind of like every five years as a vintage, it isn't so good. So 11, 14 and, and 20 uh, weren't, were sort of not the greatest ones well, here. They're going to be good, they're just not going to be... A, <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, so it's, every yeah, so it's, 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 not, it's not a disaster. It's, uh, um, you know, and I'd hate for there to be a stigma on, on 20 because of, happened. you know, bushfires or COVID or whatever, um, but mm -hmm. there were we've still been able to make some, you know, really good wines. I think a, a lot of aromatic whites that I've seen are, are really good. Chardonnay's fantastic. Um, Pinot looks pretty good. Uh, from what I've seen, maybe Shiraz and Cabernet, if from our region, but it, you know, could be, you know, in other regions, um, I haven't had a look at too many um, vintage 20 Shiraz and Cabernets yet, but uh, they're probably slightly the, the ones that have suffered the most, I guess, from, from the conditions. But there's not a lot around at all. <laughs> yeah, it was in a low yielding year as well. So, um, yeah, it's just sort of a, a, I don't know, small small quantity and uh, we'll have some good quality stuff there. But, uh, yeah, tough tough year for everyone, I think. Like for, especially especially if your livelihood was was uh, being owning a vineyard uh, because those those, uh, those yields were so so tiny and uh well a lot of uh, you know a lot of, a lot of la labor costs went up a fair bit as well this year so it, the, the economics of things just sort of not making sense at the moment mm. yeah um and just another quick one um mike hallie burton says uh, f he's a really big fan of the santlin family reserve chardonnay um and he said at the time he tried it originally that it was everything that he that he loved smooth and creamy in particular We've struggled to find this in a cool climate Chardonnay. Do you do your Chardonnays any differently or uniquely to any other cool climate Chardonnay makers? Um, not, That's a really good question. not really. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of, once again, I'll, I'll speak generally about our, our region in, in the Yarra. Um, there is a, a slight regional style um, and, and, and obviously 
um, there's similar characteristics from that variety being grown in the region, um, the, the flavor profile. Uh, but within that region, there's different vineyards and different sites and they, they provide, um, once again, the sort of different flavors. So, you know, I, I try and source um, grapes that are going to make the, the wine that we're looking to make. So, you know, we're lucky enough that we've got uh, a few growers that are great to work with. Um, they're, they're very skilled. Um, their, their vineyards are, are located in ideal spots. So um, I think when, I don't know, well, I sort of look at the French term of terroir, it doesn't just mean soil. It, it, to me, it means site. And then and, um, and that, that's the key because, you know, the, the soil's got to be good. The climate's got to be good. It's, 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 and some of these sites that you visit, you, you sort of just, you, you stand there and you realise, yeah, this is, this is an ideal position that for, for, for a vineyard. And uh, um, where we source our Chardonnay, um, the vineyard gets, it's a, it's a sheltered site, so it doesn't get any, the weather doesn't, you know, you don't get any hot northerly winds. Um, you get some lovely cool winds coming from the mountain ranges and that helps um, keep the natural acidity um, it provides a longer growing season. Um, the soils, it, it, there's, I think there's some lovely um, grey loam soils, but it also moves up to a little bit of volcanic red soil. And, and that, I think there's, there's different flavours as the soil changes. Um, and then just in terms of, in terms of winemaking, uh, look, we're just trying to make a balanced wine. You know, people can sort of take their, their styles to one extremity or the other where it's, you know, making really something really ripe and, or something really lean. And uh, uh, for us, it's always about balance uh, in, in, in flavors, in acidity, in oak, in, in every, everything. So I think also we, we take a very minimal approach because the fruit that we're, we are getting in and that we're working with is amazing. So it's really just about guiding that through the process and just keeping that ba balance. Um, but yeah, not doing too much to it at all because we don't need to because it's, it's, it's amazing. So yeah. Um, you know, we use French oak, um, it's wild fermented, it's, um, it's not fined, you know, we give it a really coarse filtration before bottling, just a single coarse filtration. So we just try and really just keep that flavour in there and we, we try not to take anything out or add anything to it. It's just about keeping it all about that fruit. Cool. Uh, Kathy, um, Jonathan uh, asks... Uh, the two of you guys working together to make wine in a bottle, how do you two work the decision-making process, all the stages of the soil, the vines, the fruit, the harvest, and so on? Is there one boss? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, we, we would probably work a bit like um, Adrian and uh, Beck, actually. So... I suppose the harvesting decision comes down largely to me, but Neil will have, I mean, he'll know it's getting pretty close anyway. I mean, we go walking through vineyards together. Um, the day-to-day -day winemaking decisions, that's things that come down to me, but anything to do with blending, I'd try and involve Neil all, all the way along. Um, he's my second palate, so if I come up with a blend, I say, what do you think of this one? And he might go, mm, and I'll go, yeah, okay. So then I'll go back and do a little re-blend and try that on him. And um, yeah, so we, we have to and froing like that. Um, yeah, I mean, there are times when it falls apart <laughs> and we're not so good at um, communicating clearly or we think that the other person must instinctively know that we're going to decide to pick something or do this or do that. Yeah, and you go, oh, no, I probably haven't actually told him about that. Yeah, so um, it's, yeah, it's, uh, uh, I suppose if we were to say one of us, boss, it changes. It depends what we're doing and we probably do more on an equal footing rather than um, one being over the top of the other. Although I don't say anything about how the vineyards are managed because I don't know enough about it. Uh, did you guys have fires over there? there? Beg your pardon? Did you guys have such a terrible vintage as the Yarra? Um, no, we, we had our own little issues. We didn't have fire and it's all relative. So we can sit here complaining about the rain that we got at the wrong time, uh, during, uh, January and February, but it's, 
there's always something worse and bushfires are something worse. Uh, we don't get droughts as such here, not where we are, so we don't have to worry so much about that. Um, so if all we've got to complain about is rain, some rain at the wrong time, um, which keeps everybody worried. I mean, it's quite interesting, um, wherever you are, any farming anything, but particularly um, growing grapes, I think you end up talking about the weather a hell of a lot. So um, too wet, too dry, too hot, too windy, too this, too that. Um, at the moment, um, I shouldn't say it, but we're a little touch too wet here. <laughs> when I'm sloshing around out, you know, out in the vineyard or out in our car park even, it's just, yeah, you need gumboots on. But I'll be complaining in another few weeks that, oh, where's all the rain gone? It's too dry now. <laughs> exactly. No, we, 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 um, we are very lucky here, and I suppose that also means that um, it's, it's very rare to have a bad year for something. I think 2006 was the year that everyone talks about being a, very, a really bad year here for Reds. Uh, last year that nearly happened and it didn't. We actually had the warm weather come back. So if that's all we're worrying about, then I think, uh, yeah, we've got it pretty good. Awesome. Well, Time has flown. We're pretty much at the end of the hour. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say to the angels or anything you'd like to add? No? Um, I'd just say thank you for um, supporting us, really, because, um, yeah, I mean, we, we are doing what we're doing and um, being able to continue to do it because you're supporting us buying our wines. And um, you're also... I, I love actually doing the posts. Um, and getting feedback because selling our wine through other avenues over the years, I don't get that feedback and I don't get the, the banter either, which I find really enjoyable. Um, it can take me a few hours on a Sunday evening in front of the telly replying to everybody, but um, at the end of it, I feel pretty good. So thank you and keep on continuing to do that. Fantastic. Adrian, Rebecca? Yeah, I think we totally... Um mimic those sentiments i think you know particularly now with with all these lockdowns and everything that's going on we are so incredibly fortunate or feel so incredibly fortunate that we're part of naked wines because um yeah i, I you know with with um everything that's going on it you know could be quite disastrous to our business if we weren't with naked wines but you know knowing that we're we're with with you guys and and we've got the support of the angels um through yeah, it's made it's made it made this uh, whole whole sort of period of, of COVID uh, much smoother ride because there are a lot of people that are you know struggling yeah. financially or lost their jobs or or you know lost their businesses and where you know I mean this you know being being part of this community um, you know we are very fortunate so yeah. it's it's a very big thanks to everyone. So thank you, and to all our fellow Melburnians who are in for another six weeks. Just uh, hang in there. Hang in there, guys, cheers. And to all the teachers who may have to be homeschooling soon, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate what you guys do. <laughs> I think all parents now really, truly appreciate <laughs> the role of a teacher. I mean, I do, my sister's a teacher, but I just never understood. So yes, if we're back in it again, is. Okay, well, thank you very much for giving up your time tonight, guys. Um, I'm sure the angels appreciate it. Lots of great comments and questions. And uh, thank you, angels. We'll see you all next Thursday. Yes. Bye. 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 Yeah.